and welcome to The Spectrum Show, the show dedicated to the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. Coming up in this episode, we get all the latest Sinclair news and top-selling Spectrum games from May 1986. I look at the new smart card for the Spectrum. I review some older games, take a look at a newer title, we follow the development of a brand new game. Jeff Neal is back with some hidden gems. And finally in a new section we look at some serious software. But first, it's the news. With the recent Sinclair buyout and all the problems associated with it, the QL was destined to be left behind in a dusty cupboard of history, as Amstrad seemed uninterested in this computer. However, it could be saved by a consortium of buyers that want to purchase the rights to the machine so they can continue development of the new rumoured QL2. The QL2 is said to have a full 68000 processor, 640k of RAM and an internal 3.5 inch disk drive. The full details were announced at the ZX Microfair, with two companies showing promise. A company called CST demonstrated their upgraded QL. The machine, named Thor, was a standard QL with various upgrades and a detachable keyboard. They also planned to release a 68020 version by September. The machine had an external 3.5 inch disk drive holding 720k and it also had connectivity for a 20 megabyte Winchester hard drive. The other company called Care Electronics were also showing their model. It contained the standard 68000 processor and a built-in disk drive, although this was not an upgraded QL but a QL compatible machine. Care hope to begin production as soon as they can get backing. The Commodore Amiga is set to launch in the UK this month alongside the Atari ST range. This could be a serious threat for the 8-bit era. Offering high resolution graphics and thousands of colours, massive amounts of RAM and built-in floppy drives, these machines, although expensive, are perfectly poised to lure 8-bit owners into the new shiny 16-bit world. With Amstrad now owning the Sinclair brand and planning new micros though, the uptake may not be as fast as expected. People always look for backward compatibility, especially those that have built up large collections, so the 8-bits may be around for a little while longer. There are rumours that when Amstrad release their first Spectrum later this year, it will come with a few new additions. It is thought they will have upgraded memory with 256k and also contain a card slot to be able to use the credit card size storage devices. This may help to kickstart the development companies back into action, who are currently holding back work until they find out what Amstrad plan. Several companies have already put 1 to 8K games on hold, and Melbourne House have shelved Rock and Wrestle altogether. It is important for Amstrad to get these machines out as soon as possible, so they can try and keep the software companies from looking elsewhere. With the Sinclair buyout still a hot subject, the after effects are still being felt and Amstrad have wasted no time in dumping huge amounts of old stock into the hands of exporters. Their aim is to clear out the older micros to prepare the way for the new range, but this leaves a lot of Spectrum owners rather worried. 20,000 QLs, 17,048 k machines and 14,016 k Spectrums have already been sold to PST, an export company. This just leaves the 48K Plus and the Spectrum 128 machines here. On the flip side, the company responsible for selling the Brazilian clone built by Micro Digital, the TK90X, which was mentioned in a previous episode, is thinking about importing these machines back into the UK to fill the gap left by Amstrad. Any legal problems around this may have dissolved, as the exact details of the buyout are still unknown, and it seems Amstrad is no longer interested in the older 48K models. And now on to the top selling games. Riding high in the charts this month are Cyber Run, the shooting collect em up from Ultimate Play the Game, Alien Highway, the isometric follow up to Highway Encounter from Vortex, Sam Fox Strip Poker, no need for descriptions here, from Martech, and Batman, the Night Lares game from Ocean. And that was the news and top selling Spectrum games from May 1986. For any of you who watched episode 23 of the show, you will have seen my review of the fantastic DivIDE interface. 
a neat add-on that lets you load games instantly, as well as options to change firmware, giving full read-write capabilities. Many of you may have considered purchasing one, but were put off by the price, but just wanted to load games into your Spectrum. Well, if you aren't bothered about writing data, and just want to load games as quickly as possible, then look no further than the Smart Card. This small interface is designed to work with early machines, those being the 16K, 48K and 48K Plus Spectrums. It is also meant to be the only device attached, so it may not work with other interfaces. First the interface itself. It's small, and as you can see, it contains an SD card slot, a set of jumpers, a reset button, an NMI button, a Kempston joystick port, and some LEDs. The first thing you need is an SD card, formatted to FAT16. Because it's FAT16, it means it will be visible on your PC or Mac, so to put games on it you simply drag files into it. You can also create folders too, if you want to organise your collection. By default it supports SNA files, or SNAP files, but can support TAP and TZX using a patched ROM, which we'll come on to later. Once you have your SD card, plug it in and connect it to your Spectrum, with the power off of course. When you power on, the interface will beep, and you will be presented with a listing from the root directory of the card. Using the keyboard or joystick, you can move up and down and select the game you want to load. The game will take between 5 and 8 seconds to load into the machine, and that's dependent on the game size itself, although snap files are usually the same size. If you wanted to use tap files, you follow the same process, but the first time you do this you'll be prompted to patch the ROM to provide support. To do this you have to make sure that dip switch 2 is set to on, obviously turning the power off first. You go back and select the tap file and follow the instructions and within a few seconds you are ready to load any tap files you want. Once you've selected the file and pressed enter it will automatically load into your spectrum. Some tap files though don't load, such as Dynamite Dan, but the instructions do say that the tape support is only experimental at the moment. Another feature of the smart card is the ROM banks. The unit has 16 ROM slots that can be loaded with compatible ROM files, like the one used for Interface 2. If you've patched your interface for tap files, the first three slots will be taken up, leaving you with 13 remaining empty slots. To add a ROM file you have to make sure that Jumper 2 is set to on. This enables writing. You then reset and hold down the space key, or press space key whilst browsing the files on the card, and this takes you to the ROM view, showing you all of the ROM banks and their contents. Pressing enter takes you to the ROM manager, where you can load or delete ROM files. To add one you simply select load, choose the slot that you want. If your ROMs are on your SD card, which is the easiest method, you choose that as the source, Navigate to the file and press enter. After a few seconds the ROM will be loaded into the bank. And you can now load this direct from the ROM manager. One final feature of the interface is the test ROM. This is loaded by default into slot B. Selecting this runs various diagnostic tests on your Spectrum and will help with any repairs that you have to do, if you are technical enough. In summary then, this is a great way to quickly load games into the early Spectrum models. It provides a joystick port, which is Kempston compatible, ROM slots and a diagnostic tool. It will work with most SD cards, including larger capacity like 4GB, but that will fit every Spectrum game you'll ever need on anyway. It's easy to use, it's fast, and the best part is the price. It costs around £21, that's all. If you're interested, it's available from the address on screen. Remember though, this is not DivIDE compatible, so you cannot change the firmware on it, which in turn means that you can't use it to write directly to the card from your Spectrum. But then again, it wasn't designed to do that. It was designed as a mass storage medium so you can store all your games and load them quickly into your Spectrum. And for that, it's a fantastic piece of kit. With my Div IDE permanently attached to my Spectrum Plus 2, this card is now permanently attached to my 48K model. So anytime I want a quick game, I can just fire it on, press the button and away I go. In 
late 1983, an unknown company started to advertise a game called Zagzen for the Spectrum. Obviously a clone of the popular arcade game Zagzen, this was the first conversion, unofficial or otherwise, and gamers clambered to get hold of a copy. There wasn't a story on the inlay, and very few words in the game itself, but I think people knew they just had to get out and destroy as much as they could. Anyone seeing or playing the arcade game would know what to expect. The screen angle is different from the arcade, displaying the game at 45 degrees, and this gives the game a strange look, but I guess it was done to help scrolling. The scrolling is in 8 character jumps, moving down one and left one square at a time, which looks awkward, but at least maintains the attributes, so we get a colourful game. Your ship casts a shadow, which is used to define the height and position, but this is tricky to keep an eye on, especially when the screen gets busy, and it soon does. There are walls of varying heights to avoid, enemy ships, rockets, and of course fuel dumps which have to be shot to keep your fuel replenished. Because of the angle, it's really difficult to judge just whereabouts you are in the playfield and often crash into rockets or walls because you misjudge things. Control is good but sometimes can be a little sluggish, with options for keyboard or joystick, but there's no option for the reverse up and down control, so to fly lower you have to push up on the joystick. Some users don't like this. Sound is used quite well with various effects for firing and explosions. Static screenshots look good but the jerky movement, coupled with the positioning problem, means it's difficult to make any real progress. And the rockets are a real pain to avoid. So, overall then, a brave attempt to recreate a classic arcade game that just falls short. This is Cauldron, released by Palace Software in 1985. Playing the role of a witch, or as some parts of the game call it, a hag, you are out to rid the land of the evil pumpkin, and at the same time get hold of the golden broomstick. To do this you have to collect six ingredients, place them in your cauldron, and make the spell required. The six ingredients are placed underground, and to get them you have to first locate the correct coloured key. But let's start at the beginning. You control the hag, and you can fly or walk, which you do depends on where you are in the game. Initially you'll fly, avoiding the various things that flap about and try and kill you, and the ones that often head straight towards you, giving you no chance to get out of the way. You can shoot them of course, but this uses up precious magic, so it's best just to try and avoid them. As you fly around, the screen moves along in a kind of cross between flip screen and push scrolling that pauses the action while the entire screen moves. Once you spot a key on the ground, you can drop down and land in the clearings, and these are the only places you can land. You then grab the key and head off looking for the door. Once located, you can land and head into the underworld looking for the ingredients, and this is where the game style changes. Your hag has to jump around, avoid the nasties, and try to locate one of the ingredients. These sections cause me great problems, for many reasons. Firstly, they're just too hit and miss. The collision detection between the hag and the platform means it's all too easy just to fall off and die. Secondly, you often have to jump between screens, and unless you know the map like the back of your hand, it's very difficult to judge where the platform will be in the next screen because you can't see it. And thirdly, some of the walls can be walked through, like large pillars for example, but there's no indication that this is possible. So again, unless you have the map, it's all down to guesswork. All of this really spoiled the enjoyment of the game for me, and eventually, after several hours of getting nowhere, I had to revert to watching the RZX playback. 
Colliding with anything will lower your magic, and once it reaches zero, you lose a hag. You have eight to start with, but these soon start to drop off as you collide with everything. Because some of the evil creatures home in on you, your hag is powerless while walking, and you can easily lose a life just collecting a key. A map of course would make things easier, and watching the RZX playback it's certainly required if you want to avoid plummeting to your death in the underground sections. On to the graphics, well they're large and well drawn, and move smoothly enough. Sound is a bit of a letdown though, and for most part you'll be playing the game in silence. There are a few zap sounds when you kill a nasty, or your hag dies, but that's about all. And there are long sections of just flying about, which can become tedious, especially as it's in silence. And one thing that puzzled me, you can collect other items that are not ingredients, and these show up in the scrolls at the top of the screen. And I've got really no idea what they are. There's nothing in the instructions about them. Overall then, a nice looking game but it does have huge problems with blind jumping and collision detection with platforms. But I suppose it's worth trying out if you like this style of game. But be warned, it's not easy. Anyone who watches the show will know how much I like shoot 'em ups and how badly I play them, so any new game that comes along is the top of my list. Here then is ZX Destroyer, released in 2014 by Retrobytes. This is an old school shooter that's hard as nails, well at least it was for me. The graphics are colourful, but because of this they're not tremendously smooth, but that doesn't matter. The action is fast and furious, and a sort of mix between Galaxian and Space Invaders. I don't really have to explain how this kind of game works, but to be honest, for me it could do with being a little bit easier right at the beginning. Sound is used well, and control is responsive, which is a good thing for this type of game. The alien bombs are tricky to avoid, and almost seem to know where I'm going to be. Maybe the aliens have improved their intelligence since the 80s, when their bombs just were so predictable and came straight down. I played this for a while and never managed to get very far, but this didn't seem to deter me, and I kept going back for more. It's a sort of pick up and play game that I like. No complex backstory, just lots of shooting. Great fun if you're a fan of shooters. Give this one a try. Welcome to this brand new section of the show. Over the next nine episodes, we're going to follow the trials and tribulations of Jason Bullough as he tries to create a fully fledged game for the Spectrum. It was while watching episode 36 of the show that he realised, as did many of us, that there wasn't really a good version of Berserk for the machine. Having written things before, back in the 80s, he decided to bite the bullet and try to recreate the arcade game. His plan was to begin in basic although he's worked in Z80 and 6502 before. He wanted to see how far he could get before being forced into machine code, and during his work he agreed to keep a diary so we could post progress on the show. The first task was to figure out how to generate the maze, make it random but playable, and of course make it fast to draw. A quick search on the internet took him to a website that explained how the arcade machine did it, effectively creating 1024 rooms, with 876 of them unique, and the possibility to create 65,536 rooms in total. He had to work out how to hold and generate all of those rooms without storing data, but still have a map that drew the same each time. 
Modifying the arcade maze generator to make it simpler, he came up with a map consisting of 1024 rooms, set out in a 32 by 32 room grid. The next task was to draw the walls for each room. The outer walls were not a problem, he just had to make sure the exits were blocked for any rooms on the outside of the maze. The inner walls were created using a fixed set of 8 pillar points. Generating a random number between 1 and 4 dictated which direction each pillar would draw a wall, and then 6 wall blocks were drawn based on those numbers. This gave the effect of a random maze, but Jason's code meant he could draw each room exactly the same each time without having to store lots of room data. Now that the maze is done, it needs to be tested, so Jason quickly added a placeholder to move around the screen and go from room to room. At the moment his code, which is in BASIC, generates the same maze each time, but there's no reason why, by setting the seed generator, to use something like the number of seconds since power on, it can't be made to generate a different maze for each game. For now though, he's happy with this routine, and although not lightning fast, it certainly does the job. This feature and the game will continue next month. Hello and welcome to Hidden Gems. In this section we take a look at some games that aren't as well known but are still superb and well worth picking up and playing even today. Today we're going to take a look at a game called Zeno which was released in 1986 by ANF Software and written by Binary Design. Now an interesting thing about this game even before we start is although it was written by Binary Design and released by ANF Software in the game there are actually advertisements for Quicksilver games so I don't know if this was originally supposed to be released by Quicksilver or Binary Design thought it might be released by Quicksilver but that's a interesting fact and if you keep a look out during the video you will see some Quicksilver adverts during the game. While this game was released by ANF Software I like probably many people actually know it from a different release it came on something called the 20 game pack which was given away with ZX Spectrums bought at Comet around 1986 and a friend of mine for Christmas got a plus two Spectrum with this game pack for Christmas, I guess it was 1986-1987 and that was a really really good game pack, it had some really really good games on it and this was one of them. We used to play this around his house in his bedroom, he'd fire it up and we played it tons and the reason that this is a hidden gem and something that I think people should go back and play is this is still possibly the best two player game I have ever played. It can be manic fun, absolutely brilliant. Beating your comp opponent is really, really good. I've played Play Evolution Soccer on various consoles, first played it on the PlayStation 2, and believe me, while that's excellent, don't get me wrong, I think Play Evolution Soccer and some, some of the modern soccer games are absolutely superb. It doesn't beat the fun that you get with this game. The gameplay is actually fiendishly simple. There's a ball which you have to try and get into your opponent's goal. And to do that, you have a kind of hockey puck, a squashed sphere if you like, that you need to bounce around. And the way that you do that is each puck has what can only be described as a piece of elastic with some crosshairs at the end. So you move the crosshairs which controls where the end of this piece of elastic ends up on the playing field. You then press fire and your puck is prepared held towards those crosshairs. Obviously, it being elastic, the further away from your puck the crosshairs are, the faster your puck goes. And your puck can then bounce into things, the edges of the playing field, the opponent's puck, or most likely what you wanted to do is hit the ball and try and get it into your opponent's goal. There's an added gameplay mechanic in that there is a timeout for how long you can take over your turn. It can be really long, making the games much more strategic, or short, making them much more frantic. I like to set it pretty short, it can be between 1 and 9 seconds, and to be honest with you, around 3 or 4 seconds tends to be a good timeout to have. Much shorter than that, and what you tend to find is you can't do some long shots, and sometimes in the game, you 
you need to take long shots because you'll be attacking your opponent's goal and all of a sudden the ball gets out of position. Your opponent almost has a free shot at your goal and what you want to do on your turn is to run back into defence. So sometimes you'll find you're attacking your opponent's goal and you think, I'm in trouble here if I don't get back. So you want to zoom back across the board, pull yourself off screen and get into a defensive position from an offensive position. I have read some reviews of this game and some comments on it where people have said, I don't like this game, the angles aren't right. Sometimes when you hit the corner, you just go flying off parallel to the edge of the playing field. That's actually probably in there on purpose. And that gameplay mechanic where you do that is incredibly useful because what it means is if your opponent managed to get the ball just in front of your goal and on their next turn will easily knock it into your goal, you can use that to knock it away from the goal. Cool. When we discovered that when we were kids, that made a huge difference to some of the games we played. It it was a saving move that, when you pulled off, was really, really satisfying. Another thing you can do is take your turn really, really quickly. Say your opponent has a clear shot on goal, and the ball's being propelled towards the goal. You can actually do an interception and intercept the ball before it gets to your goal and knock it away, and do a save that way as well. So, there are subtleties with this game that as you keep playing you learn and you get better and better and better. It is amazingly simple but it is also incredibly deep from a gameplay mechanic point of view. This game is also probably ripe for a modern remake. With tablets, I'm sure you could do a touchscreen design where you use your finger to swipe to scroll around the playing field and then just do a single press to position your crosshairs and off your puck goes. That would make a great game. You could do it networked so you could play two-player and be playing somebody else at the other side of the world perhaps and have some absolutely superb games. If anyone does that, please let me know because I'd certainly download it. That's Zeno by ANF Software written by Binary Design. I'd encourage everyone to download it. It's free to download on the World of Spectrum website. Fire it up in an emulator, have a few games against the computer to get a feel of it, and then get some friends round, have a few beers, and play a few two-player games. You'll absolutely love it. It's superb once you get into it. I'd really, really encourage everyone to do that. So until next time, happy gaming! Welcome to a new section of the show, taking a look at non-game software. We all know Clive Sinclair wanted the Spectrum to be more than a games machine, and there is a lot of software out there that covers many other aspects of computing. The first piece of software I'm going to look at is Bodyworks, released in 1985 by Genesis Productions. The large box boasts some impressive features like a dynamic exploration of the human body with seven programs, games and simulations. There are two tapes containing sections on cells, digestion, respiration, circulation, nerves, muscles and something called marathon. There's a nice booklet that comes with it, setting out what each section is about and has some nice images to help things along. On to the software then. The first program, Cells, explains different types of cells, obviously, and allows you to select different parts of the cell for a more detailed description. The numbers in brackets are used to identify specific parts of the diagram, and to highlight them you just press the key. Cell elements are then explained in simple terms, and some have animations that show how substances can enter and leave the cell. Next we have digestion, and here we follow food from being eaten into the stomach, into the duodenum and into the lower intestine, and thankfully no further than that. You can then follow three types of food as they pass through the body but they're all pretty similar using the same character based animations. Lastly we are taken to the liver simulation where we can control glucose entering the bloodstream and change the demand from the cells. This little game shows how too much food and little demand will cause the body to store excess elements. Next we move on to respiration. This attempts to explain how we breathe. It uses a nice diagram too that shows the blood flowing around the body through the heart and being oxygenated and deoxygenated. We can then see how all this operates at different rates, for example resting or running. 
The next programme is circulation. This covers the blood's journey through various parts of the body and uses a quite complex diagram. Having to press space for each stage does become a little dull at times, but at least at the end there's an option to show a fast replay. It would have been better to offer this at the start, I think. Next it's on to nerves, and here we are told how signals are sent from our nerves via the spinal column and into the brain. It all seems very simple. Maybe I should become a doctor. Then we get a sort of simulation where you can change two types of setting and see what the result will be. The sight one allows you to adjust wavelength and lumens and when sent to the brain it will show you what happens. It took me a while to figure out where to look for this but it is just the text at the top of the screen. Sound is very similar, lets you change wavelength and decibels and again you can see the result. I suppose because of the spectrum sound and colour capabilities it would be difficult to show exact results. Onwards then and onto muscles. And here we are shown how the brain controls the muscles around the body. You can select something like a left leg and see the journey of the signal from the brain to the leg or whichever part of the body you chose. You then get to see some basic animations. Lastly, we get the muscle control game. And this is quite good, I actually enjoyed this. You have to control three different muscle groups so that you can point to one of the flashing boxes. And it does get you thinking. I wasn't very good at first, but as I played more, I got the hang of it. I think a game based on this would be really good. The final program then is Marathon. And here we're using all the knowledge that we've acquired whilst watching all these programs to try and guide your runner during a marathon. You get to control the heart rate and output, which in turn causes numerous stats to be displayed as you push your runner to the limit. The terrain changes too, so you can adjust your speed based on that, and of course your current health status. It's not very exciting to be honest, and I completed the short run, which is 5 miles, by just setting the man to run at 8 miles an hour. The package as a whole then isn't bad, and would be a good teaching aid for children. I think the program would be better if there was someone telling you about each animation, rather than having to read the sparse text or trawling through the booklet. It would be ideal for a parent to use though, and I think the child's interest would be kept up if it wasn't for the long loading times. The best part for me was the muscle game. Well that was the first piece of serious software. More next month. Well that's the end of this episode, I hope you enjoyed it and thanks for watching. You can get in touch by using the details on screen. See you soon.